Beginning Church and our online worshipers. Thank you so much for joining us for Bible study on tonight. Our scripture tonight will come from John chapter 14, verse number 2. John chapter 14, verse number 2. And it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Verse number three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And our song for tonight is, when we all get to heaven, what a joyous day it will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. When we all Forgive us the sin, Father God. Bless our lives to be pure before you, that we will receive your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise God for another privilege, another honor, another great opportunity to worship him to dig into his word and for his word to make a difference in our lives. We thank God for who he is and what he's all ready done. He's blessed us one more again Amen. to be on the land of the dying hand is for the land of the living. Amen. We are on the land of the dying hand is for the land of the living. And God has, has blessed us. Hallelujah to the land. God has blessed us one more again. He has blessed us and moved upon our lives. Not because we deserve it, but because he's a good God and he has blessed us again. And he keeps blessing us again, 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 and again. He has 
Anybody been blessed by the Lord today? Anybody? Let me just search the room. Yes. Anybody yes. been blessed? Anybody? Yes. Anybody? Yes. Just anybody? Yes. Just one person been blessed by the Lord? God has blessed us, and it's good that one has been blessed because God just keeps right on, right on blessing us. Hallelujah. Um, our scripture for tonight is Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Such a fitting scripture for us tonight. As we close out this day, this this third day of unit two, third day of unit two, we're looking to close out this third day of unit two on tonight. We're on page number 40 in the Experiencing God book. Our scripture is Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. We've been talking much about God steering our lives. God being in control. When we use the word Lord in the New Testament, the word Lord translates in some places as master, the controller of our lives. So we're looking forward to God being our master, Jesus being our master, the Holy Spirit being our master and our controller. Yes, we want him to navigate the ways of life on our behalf. He is our controller. He's our master. He is our Lord. Let me read for you in the New King James Version, uh, Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faint nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. Isaiah gives us this promise today. He asked the question, have you not known? Don't you know God? Have you not known God? He asked the question, have you not heard? Do you not know God? Have you not heard about God? And then he goes on to describe. He is the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. He's the God of the Bible. He is the God of the Bible. There are a lot of gods, but there is only one God of the Bible. Have you not heard about it? Have you not heard him? Isaiah 40, 28 through, Isaiah 40, 28 through 31, he is the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. Everything on earth, Psalm chapter 20, Psalms number, rather, Psalms numbers 24 and 1 says that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, they that dwell in it, everything belongs to him. And Isaiah asked the question, have you not heard of him? He's the everlasting God. He is the Lord. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. He is the God who created everything. Everything. I mean, he created everything. Can you think of anything that God didn't create? The answer is no. He created everything. It amazes me how scientists find all of these new things in life. And they, they didn't find them, they didn't discover them, and then they think they created some things. Even science says that scientists doesn't create things. Even science says that energy cannot be, be created, but it's only changed from one, one form to the other. Energy 
was created by God. Everything was created. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. And this God we serve, look what Isaiah says. He neither faint nor is he weary. He's not weary. He's not tired. He doesn't faint. His understanding is far beyond we, what we can search out. It's far beyond what we can imagine. His, his understanding is unsearchable. God has an understanding of all things. Why wouldn't he? If he created it all, he knows it all. No man knows it all. No man knows everything. But God knows everything. His understanding is unsearchable. And this is what God does for us. He gives power to the weak. He gives power to the weak. The weak has power. And they only have power because God gave it to them. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases their strength. Those who have no might, those who have no strength, those who have no power, God increases it. When you think you can't go another further, God increases power. He increases strength. He increases your might. Has anybody ever been to a point where you just got to a point where you, I just can't make it? I just can't go any further. I just can't take it anymore. Say that's here that the God we serve, the God, the creator, the Lord, the God who is is the creator of the ends of the earth. He, he is the one who gives power to the weak. So when you get weak, you call on that God. When you get weak, you don't pick up weights to, to get your might. You call on God. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases the God we serve is awesome God. He is the awesome God. There is no God like the God of the Bible. He increases strength. Verse 30, Isaiah 40, verse 30 says, even the youth shall faint and be weary. He goes from this supernatural thing, dealing with this supernatural God, to human beings, and young people ought to be able to hang in there. But he says, even the young folk, even the young folks shall faint and be weary. It just told you that God is never weary. God is never weak. But the young people will be weak and they will faint and they will be weary. I mean, just plain old tired. Young people. And then he says, and the young men shall utterly fall. Young men, they, they gonna, they going to be Falling. People that we think are mighty, people that we think have strength, those who have muscles will fall. Those who have power will fall. Those who have might will fall. If they don't depend on the one who gives strength, the one who gives power, but the one who gives might. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. It has been said that a man's job creates his reputation and make him who he is. But let me share with you. If you don't depend on God, mm. it doesn't matter what job you have. Right. Man's money. The Bible even says that money answers all things. And we know the Bible never contradicts itself, right? But the Bible says that money answers all things. What's it talking about? Can money really pay for your, your, your well-being? Can money really buy your peace? Can money really pay for your health? No. The Bible says money answers all things. What thing are you talking about? You're talking about your car, your house, your, your clothes. Money will answer it. Money will handle all things. But when you look at Isaiah 40, it says the young men should utterly fall. Verse 31 says, but those of us who wait on the Lord. It 
doesn't suggest it. It says we have to wait on the Lord. Mm -hmm. We tell our young people, don't get involved in stuff that's get rich quick schemes. Just wait on the Lord to bless you. Mm -hmm. Don't rob, don't steal. When we grew up, Daddy said, said there are two things you go to jail for, you're going to beg them to keep you in there. <laughs> He said, now you go to jail for getting in trouble. But there are two types of trouble if you get in. And I can't tell you what dad said in church, okay? <laughs> and it's on Wednesday night, so I can't use the words he said either. So y'all don't use those kind of words on Wednesday. <laughs> but dad said that if you go to jail for stealing, and if you go to jail for drugs, when I show up down there, after I've gotten sick and tired of you being in there, he said, I'm going to leave you in there for a while. Mm. But when I finally show up down there and find out you went to jail for stealing and for drugs, you're going to beg them to keep you locked up. Mm. Because this brother on the outside, and he didn't say brother, this brother on the outside that I call daddy is going to make sure that I'm worse when I get out than I am when I'm in. He says, first of all, you don't have any reason to steal and take anything. If it's not yours, leave it alone. And he says, you don't have any reason to do drugs because you don't need anything to control your mind, your heart, your affection. And you know what? I believe that a minute. He has set a basis for all of us that if you go to jail for stealing, if you go to jail for drugs, you're going to be better off locked up. Because when you get out, life's going to change for you. Those who wait on the Lord, what Dad was trying to say is just wait. Wait till you can buy it. Wait till you can afford it. Just wait until you can call it your own. Don't take anything from anybody. I wish that somebody would have told the children we have in the 21st century, stop taking stuff from people. Work. They pay you for working. They give you money for working. And then some of them had an audacity to say, I, ain't, I don't want that job. I'm better than that. If you were better than that, you would have a job. Mm -hmm. True. Working at fast food restaurants are better than stealing. True. He said, let me tell you something. Just steal something if you want. Mm -hmm. you, you go in, don't steal it. And when the people in the 21st century, when parents in the 20, when the people in the 20th century, when parents in the 20th century said, go on, they really double damn you to try. Now try me and see. You know, God says, bring you to all the tithes into the soul house and there will be meat in my house. Go on, try me. Daddy wasn't quoting that script. He said, try me. And he meant it. What I'm saying to you is, we have things in our lives we just have to wait on. God sees so far down the road ahead of us. And we just got to sit sometime and wait. We have to work sometime and wait. We have to pray sometime and wait. But Isaiah says that there's a reward for those who wait. First 31 says, for those who wait on the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall renew. In other words, if you get weak, God has a way of renewing your strength. If you feel like you're going to pass out, God has a way of renewing your strength. If you feel like you can't make it anymore, if you trust in God, God has a way of renewing your strength. Hang in there and wait on the Lord. Amen. Those who wait on the Lord, they, the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like wings, with wings like eagles. There's no bird like the eagle. 
I used to tell young people, and I think I'll repeat it to our young people sooner or later. This seems like a good month to repeat it. Turkeys hang out on the ground, and they become Sunday and Thanksgiving dinner. But eagles fly high. And they fly high where the turkeys can't fly. The question is, are you an eagle or are you a turkey? Turkeys, turkeys can't soar like eagles. One thing the brother was right about, young people have to believe that they can fly. Young people have to be told that I can touch the sky. Young people have to be still told that, that I believe I can soar. Well, young people have to be told that I can imagine running through an open door. We must believe we can fly. How much so should we believe we can fly in the church? How much so do we believe that we can reach souls for Christ in the church? The Bible says that we wait on the Lord, we will renew our strength. We will mount up with wings like eagles. Look at the reward. Look at the promise. Run up with wings like eagles. We will run and not be worried or weary. We will run and not get tired. I guess the songwriter got some truth to it when he says, I've been running for Jesus and I'm not tired yet. I criticize him because sometimes I just get tired in my body, tired in my mind, tired in my emotions. But the Bible says, Isaiah says, when you get to that point where you are weary, when you are tired, God will renew your strength. God will rejuvenate you. God will do something miraculous in your life that you cannot even imagine. And he does it when you wake up. Will you wait? Will you please wait? God got something better if you just wait. And the, and the thing about God God and waiting on God is that God will give you something you don't even know to pray about. While you're praying and you ought to pray, you ought to be specific in your prayer, but while you are praying, God has already worked it out. The songwriter says, while we're trying to figure it out, God has worked it out. It's our job just to be faithful to God. When you're faithful to him, if you wait on him, he will allow you to run and not get weary. Final thing he says, they that wait on the Lord shall walk and not faint. First of all, he says you, you will run and not give up. Then he says you will walk and not pass out. Because you're trusting and putting your faith in God. Isn't that awesome? You got to trust him. You know, if God gave us everything we asked for, when we asked for it, there would be no need for faith. And you know, that, that's a false prophet that will tell you today that I asked God for something, he gave it to me every time. There's stuff I've been asking God for <laughs> long before I started passing this church. And in September the 7th will be 20 years and I've been asking God for more than 20 years. And, but I understand one thing. I still got the way. Yes. Still got the way. Still got the way. Still got the way. And as I wait, I'm going to praise the one who's the magnificent God. Amen. Lady like said the other day, I know that my blessings are on the other. My blessings are on the other side of the door. And while I'm waiting on God to open, see, don't kick the door down. Don't come up with a strategy. While you're waiting on God to open the door, you ought to be praising Him in the hallway. You ought to be honoring Him outside the door. While you're waiting on God to open the door, you ought to just break out into praise and say, "Lord, I thank you." I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, I thank you for blessing me while I wait. Lord, I thank you for renewing my spirit. You got to learn to pray like that. You can see it before it happens. And whatever is on the other side of the door, you realize that it's a blessing from the Lord. Yes. If you do it right for the Lord. Yes? Everybody with me? Amen. Everybody? 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 
So when we wait on the Lord, the Lord is able to, to lift us up to a level where we don't faint, we don't pass out, we don't be weary, we don't give up, but he is able to keep us. The Apostle Paul says it like this. He says, don't get weary in well-doing, for in due seasons you will reap and you're not going to faint. Don't get weary and well do it. I, I have to tell some people, don't let your blessing become your curse. Mm, that's right. Because some people can't stand to be blessed like they are. Because when they get their blessing, they do the wrong thing with it, and they start missing church. Brother Miles, they say, I ain't going down there. Mm. I can watch online, wash my dishes, wash my clothes, feed the baby. I can do all that at one time. But when you were praying, you promised the Lord that you were going to have some cheeks in the seat. You promised the Lord that you were going to get dressed for church every Sunday. That you were going to be faithful in Bible study and in Sunday school. But what happened was, God blessed you and now your blessing has become your curse. You don't have to worry about food anymore. don't have to worry about money anymore. So I ain't really got to worry about God anymore either. Isn't that something? Your blessing became your curse. And when you get that right job and your blessing becomes your curse, then that job is temporary. You no, know, all, all the stuff we have are temporary anyway, right? Everything we have, everything God has blessed with us with on planet Earth, it is temporary. You ought to be laying up some timber over yonder. What do I mean, laying up timber? Sitting up timber. What does that mean? You ought to be sitting up timber. I'm still praying. What does that mean? Am I the only one from the country? Am I the only one from the 20th century? But, not, but with Lazio, yeah, you're the only one from the country. <laughs> he said, you, ain't nobody country like you in here. <laughs> Sister Derek, yes, ma'am. I'm sitting up timber. Wood for my home. Why did they say timber and not say bricks? Because in the country we didn't have a brick house. And we could only visualize what we saw on planet Earth unless we read it in the Word. And because we saw wooden houses, we had to send up timber up yonder so we could live in a, another wooden house up there. Because our imagination could not imagine bricks. And guess what? When we get over there, I'm sure we're not going to have a brick house. We're going to have some that we can't even imagine. The, uh, the Apostle John writes Revelation, and, the, and John the Revelator, he gets caught up and he says, I counted 144,000, then I saw a number. He started counting that number. And guess what he says, Sister Brown? I see a number that no man could number. What that says to me is that God has some things that we can only imagine. God has some blessings that God has not even shown us on planet Earth. God has a way of blessing us while we are here just so he can give a tip of the blessing we will have over there. We get caught up on the stuff we have over here. And we frown on people that don't have. But if I don't get rich down here, it's all right. Mm. Well, that's right. My father is rich in houses and in land. The cattle on the thousand hills belong to him. And I've come to understand that even the hill belong to him. Amen. If I wait on it. If I just wait on God. If I just wait on God. We all please wait on it. <laughs> we all wait with me. Pray for me that I wait on it. I'm praying for you that you wait on. Will you just wait? Just, just hold your coat. Just watch what God is doing. Mm -hmm. If you wait on him, he'll renew your strength. And this, this is what God does. In the midst of your waiting, he gives you strength more to wait. How many of you you've uh, prayed for patience? God, give me patience. What happens when you pray for patience? I'm still waiting. So sweet, he makes you wait. It makes you wait. When you pray for patience, what else happens when you pray for patience? You get a test. 
and you become <laughs> Now you 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 all Christian like and you love the Lord and you praying for patience and when the moment you pray for patience, you go through a test. All trouble breaks loose. I gotta say it like that because mama's listening. All trouble breaks loose. I love mama's listening. All trouble breaks loose. And when trouble breaks loose, and you sit back and look at God and say, God, I pray for patience. Well, you said that you were willing to wait. So God is allowing you to wait. And when he allows you to wait, you got to wait with the right posture. And when you wait with the right, right posture, you're praising God, even if he doesn't give me what I want. Now, there are some things that God just didn't give me. And I come to the conclusion that he's not going to give it to me. Does that mean I'm giving up? No. God has something better for me. And I just wait. He says that while you're waiting, I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to renew the strength. I'm going to give you power. And let me tell you, the, the fruit of the Spirit is better than money. All right. Favor Amen. is better than money. If God gives me favor, I don't need money. Because if he gives me favor, uh, somebody else will bring the money. That's what he says. He says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It didn't say God going to give it to you. It said that God will cause men to give it to you. God will touch the hearts of men. I'm praying God, God touch their hearts. I got a list of folk at my house. I got a list. In my back room, I got a list. A folk that I just ask God to touch their hearts. And guess why they're on that list? Because I know they got it. Mackenzie Scott is on my list. Go on Google it. Mackenzie Scott is on my list. Lord, if you hear me now, bless the heart of Mackenzie Scott. Number one, she's on my list because she has it. Number two, she's on my list because she's giving it away. Number three, she's on my list because she has a heart that's turned toward the people of God. Okay, who's Google it back now? Who's McKenna Scott? She's on my list. Jeff Bezos' ex wife. Jeff Bezos' ex wife. Why, why am I praying for Jeff Bezos' ex wife? I got a wife. <laughs> and I've come to the conclusion you can't have them too. Because most men, now I know some of y'all are different, most men can't have one. Why am I praying for just Jeff Bezos' ex wife? Mackenzie Scott, I'm calling your name out before the Lord. Why am I praying about her? Brother Whitlock, Brother Miles, somebody? She's giving away the billions that she got in her divorce settlement. She's giving <laughs> she's worth She's giving away billions upon billions of dollars. I'm asking the Lord, touch her heart in the name of Jesus. And for the sister who's helping her direct who she gives to, I hope you hear me now. My name is Matthew Alexander Davis. The church is New Beginning Missionary Baptist Church. We are located at 4251 Shiremine Road, Houston, Texas, 77048 USA. Shiremine is spelled S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. Lord, touch a heart in the name right of Jesus. Now, Lord. <laughs> Lord, every penny will go toward ministry. I will not keep anything for myself. Lord, give it in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I got other folk on my list. In case God chooses not to use Mackenzie Scott, I got other folk on the list. Belinda Gates, you need to add her. <laughs> Belinda Gates, give what? They told me that you can be blessed of the Lord when you catch people in divorce, destitute, and death. <laughs> divorce, destitute, and death. Folks, just give away money. If God gives me favor, I don't need to make it all. God can touch the hearts of people. He says that you'll be able to walk and not faint. 
That's the God we serve. Amen. He's an awesome God. Let's look at more Mullah, Mullah or Mullah, whichever it is on page number 40. We'll see how Mullah or Mullah did it. I call him Mullah because I know Harry Mullah's name is still similar. You call him Mullah, that's fine with me. I don't, I don't remember phonetically what the two dots over the U stand for, so I'm going to call him Mullah. Okay, readers, page 40, Experiencing God book. We'll do page 40, page 41, and then we'll do a review on page 21. We'll do page 40, the bottom of page 40, the top of page 41, and then we'll close out with a review on page 21. Sister Woods is our reader. I seek at the beginning to get my heart into such a state that it has no will of its own in regard to a great, a given matter. Nine-tenths nine of the trouble with people generally is just here. Nine-tenths of the difficulties are overcome when our heart are ready to do the Lord's will, whatever it may be. When one is truly in this state, it is usually but a little way to the knowledge of what he is, what his will is. Verse number two. Having done this, I do not leave the results to feeling or simple impression. If so, I make myself liable to great delusion. Thank you. Let's look at number one. You got three, got two. Got three. Okay, number three. I seek the will of the Spirit of God through or in connection with the Word of God. The Spirit of the Word must be combined. If I look to the Spirit alone without the Word, I lay myself open to the great delu delusions also. If the Holy Ghost guide us at all, He will do it according to the Scripture and never contrary to them. Okay, thank you. Look at, look at number one. I have to keep my heart in such a state that it has no will of its own when I'm regarding a given matter. He says that I got to keep my heart in such a way that my will becomes God's will. I have to keep my heart in such a way that my heart is not what's guiding me, but God's will is. I have to keep my heart in such a way that when God says no, wait, or maybe, mm. instead of saying yes, I got to keep my heart in such a way that it's yes to your will, God, and not to mine. Second part of that says nine-tenths of the trouble with people generally is just here. What he's saying is 90% uh, the trouble we find ourselves in is because our heart's not turned toward God. 90% of the stuff we go through is the stuff that we could have avoided if our hearts were turned toward God. 90% of the stuff we go through would have been avoided had we sought God rather than things and stuff. 90% of it. Isn't that amazing? If our focus, if our hearts were turned toward God, 90% of the walking around in the wilderness could be avoided if we had just focused on God. Questions or comments? He says 9 tenths, 90%, right? 90% of our troubles come from a lack of, of doing God's will. The lack of our hearts turned toward God. Whatever it may be. Then he says, nine tenths, ninety percent of the difficulties are overcome when our hearts are ready to do God's will, whatever it may be. So he says, first of all, we can avoid trouble if our hearts are turned toward God. Then secondly, because we're human. When we find ourselves in trouble, all we have to do is turn our hearts toward God, toward his will, 
and do his will above our will. Our hearts turn in a position where, Lord, I'm an empty cup filled me. The psalmist says in Psalm 23, he makes my cup to run over. His cup didn't run over until he realized the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. Amen. If you want your cup to run over, understand that the Lord is your shepherd. This word shepherd in the Hebrew means my feeder. So the Bible talks about two feeders. Number one, the first feeder is God. The second feeder is your pastor. It's a, it amazing me. It's amazing to me how people can turn their back on their feeder, God. How they can give God all these excuses. We talked about it Sunday. God throws a, a big banquet and asks all of these people to come, and, and they got excuses. What was one of the excuses that they made on Sunday? Luke chapter 14. What's one of the excuses? He got married. Man got married. Well, those women jump right on that one. <laughs> I mean, I had six women at one time. <laughs> Nearly six women at one time. <laughs> married? That joke got married. Now, they, they, they're making that comment, Brother Whitlock, but they don't realize it was the woman that was at fault. The man says, I got married, so I can't come. So Brown, I told him Sunday that you better be careful who you marry. Because if she doesn't add to you, she will take from you. That's right. That's right. If he doesn't add to you, he takes from you. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to figure out how, how so many women meet somebody online they've never seen before, mm -hmm. never met before, mm -hmm. never talked to before. They just type in words online and men are able to take their whole life savings. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about $100,000. I'm talking about millions of dollars mm -hmm. because men complimented them. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy. It's, I mean, there are some women that are so frustrated with life until they just give up all that stuff. Sell everything. I'm so glad no women <coughs> in the New Beginning Church caught up on life. These men get them to sell everything, give them everything, and then they go on the news talking about, I thought he loved me. <laughs> what love got to do with it? <laughs> and then he pays your way to one flight, on one flight that you really love. One night stand, and you're going to dump it off. And figure it out, and I just, but when it comes to the Lord, when it comes to the Lord, we don't do that. We don't trust Him. I think it was Denzel Washington that says, we, we trust the bus driver to drive us. We trust the pilot to fly us. We trust the cook to cook for us. But we won't trust the Lord to bless us. My, my, my. We trust men more than we trust God. We trust the doctor to take care of us. But we won't trust God to bless us. 90% of the issues we have are because our hearts are not turned toward God. We don't give in to his knowledge. We don't give in to his will. Number two. Have you done that? I do not leave the results for the feelings or simple impressions. I do not leave the results to feelings. It's not about how you feel. Men have given their lives because of how she made me feel. Men have given their entire Life saving because of the way somebody made them feel. The best thing to do is think with your head instead of, instead of your heart. If it doesn't line up, we talked about it last week, if the word of God doesn't line up with your, your spirit, I hear the spirit telling me. The 
Spirit of the Lord is just speaking to me right now. If it doesn't line up with the words, and when somebody talking, you ask them, where well, does it line up with the word of God? You got heart burning, you talking about this the spirit. This is what you just ate. It's something you just drank. You talking about the spirit. If the spirit that's speaking to you is not lining up with God's word, then it's not the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, it's a spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit he. It has to line up. God never contradicts what God says. You can't depend on a simple impression. It was, it's a, it was an impression on my heart. I mean, people who are normally stable people, when they get saved, they become unstable. That's the problem. Don't walk around talking about, I'm going to write this check. Now it's, it's, I'm going to put this money in or I'm going to wire this money and God going to catch it for me. Wires bounce too. <laughs> Y'all remember the days when, when you wrote a post-dated check? And when you got off at 5 o'clock, you tried to catch the bank before 6 o'clock. You done post-dated the check. But when you get home, there's a yellow slip on your door. Because you didn't catch the check. It's not God's fault. We put ourselves in positions, and when we put ourselves in those positions, we expect God to come now, Lord, come quick in the name of Jesus. I said, like a Lord, come in the name of Jesus. It was impressed upon my heart. If your budget... If your budget won't allow for it, God's not going to allow for it. God got you out of trouble the last time. And the last time. And the last time. Come on, get out of that car dealership with your hand on that car, praying for that car. Leave that car alone. <laughs> one, lady, one lady called the pastor and said, oh, well, the pastor called her. He, he called her. He, he said, Oh, I'm in this department store. When I leave here, I'm going to the car dealership and I'm going to just lay my hand. He said, get out of there. <laughs> Go home. If you don't have it, don't get it. Well, I figured I can work overtime here. Don't depend on anything that you don't have. The senior saints back home are saying like this. Don't count your eggs before they hash. Leave it alone. So it has to be something that lines with the word. Because if you don't do it God's way and it doesn't line up with the word, <laughs> the text says that you are going through delusions. You're fooling yourself. The spirit is upon me. But you're fooling yourself. It has nothing to do with God. Number three, I seek the will of the Spirit of God. I seek the will of the Spirit of God. And the will of the Spirit of God is never going to contradict God himself. Never going to contradict, contradict God's word. I seek the will of the Spirit of God through and in connection with the word of God. People have gotten themselves in much trouble. And people even said they, they prayed before they went and talked to their boss. And they got dismissed. And see, they don't dismiss you like at church. See, at, at church, at church, you can fire an employee and they'll sit on the front row on Sunday morning and, and mean mode. At church, you can tell a, a volunteer, we no longer need your services, and she'll walk around, and he'll walk around and talk to every member in the church. But on your job, it doesn't matter if you're leaving in a good way or a bad way. Security, we have one up front that we need you to walk out. And they laugh and smile with you all the way out. And guess what? Before you walk out the door, your key card is deactivated. Matter of fact, when you walked in that morning, 
IT turned it off when they saw it come up. Whereas you go to lunch, you can't get back in. But at church, people can walk. You know, we have so much freedom. People can do whatever they want to do, act any kind of way, and disturb the whole congregation. And all of a sudden, they just show back up the next day. And they act like nothing happened. But they told everybody, 600 people know how <laughs> Those who attend and those who do not. So we, we got a point. Our point is we have to make sure that the Holy Spirit guides us, the Holy Ghost, whichever you choose, the Holy Ghost guides us according to the scripture, and it's never contrary one to the other. So Sister Davis, I think, has the last three. Um, number four. Next, I take into account providential circumstances. These often plainly indicate God's will in connection with his word and spirit. Number five, I ask God in prayer to reveal his will to me aright. Number six, thus through prayer to God, the study of the word and reflection, I come to a deliberate judgment according to the best of my ability and knowledge, and of my mind is thus at peace and continues to, and continues after two or three more petitions, I proceed accordingly. So when we look at number four, providential circumstances. Providential means that this is divine insight. That means that God is intervening. It may not be what we look for. It may not be what we like, but God is intervening, it's providential. God has providentially intervened. Everybody who is saved and everybody who's going to be saved, God already know about it. Somebody asked the other day, well, if God already know about it, why we got to evangelize? Because we evangelize because we're obedient. And as we're obedient, God says, some sow, some water, and then God gives the increase. God intervenes in our circumstances. God's will is in connection with God's word and God's spirit. Never contradict each other. I must ask God in prayer to reveal his will to me aright. I want to make sure that God's will is revealed to me accurately. I want to make sure that God is revealing to me those things that he would have me to be revealed. Number six, we pray to God, we study God's word, and we reflect on what God said. We pray to God, we study God's word. The Bible says, search the scripture for in them there is life. Search the scripture. You have to dig into the word of God. I'm going to ask this question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm stating that I'm asking it so you won't raise your hand out of turn. How many are just sick and tired of going through the Bible every year? Couldn't even read. Boy, y'all got some poker faces out. We, go, we, we went through the Bible, New and Old and New Testament, we journal. We went through the Bible, New Testament, without journal. You're going through the Bible, New Testament, German if you want to. And so the next step is to go through the Bible, journaling in chronological order. So we can really see the picture. We should never, ever, ever get sick and tired of God's word. We ought to saturate. That's an electronic term. Saturate ourselves means to fill up. And when you saturate, when the first word to saturation electronically is a transistor. When you saturate a transistor, then it lets off stuff that was in it all the time. And it creates an attitude that's different. It affects the electronic circuit in such a way that it empowers the next part of the circuit. That's what we have to do. We have to saturate ourselves in the word of God so it will empower us that we can change the world. We got to become change makers. We have to become change agents. 
people ought to see us, hear us, watch us, and the world around us ought to change. People ought to say, regardless if you are a hardcore sinner or not, people ought to say, you are not what you used to be. I see a difference in you. And it should not be because you had a bad day. It should not be because you had some awful disease. When you're saturated in the word of God, then your aura, your spirit, let off stuff for others to live by. Saturate ourselves in the word of God. Who has number three? I think that's Brother Miles, right? Brother Miles, pass the mic to the boots. Brother Miles, he's going to tell us right quickly what's going on here. Number three. Check the correct answer for each of the following questions. A. How did Muller begin his search for God's will? That's your answer. Okay, give me an answer. I like the answers. The answer is two and three. Okay, tell he us. He made that. sure that he had no will of his own. Okay. And three, he tried to get to the place he wanted only God work. He wanted only God's will. Okay, so he has no will of his own. He gives his will over to God's will, and then he wanted only God's will. Okay, go ahead. B. What did Muller say leads to possible delusions or false directions? That would be four, all of the above. Yeah. One, basing a decision on feelings alone. Two. Following the slightest impressions. Three, looking to the spirit alone for direction. So you're telling me that if I, I'm a Christian, I can't look to the spirit? The spirit, you look to the spirit, but the spirit must agree with the word. Amen. C. C. In which of the following pairs did Mala look for agreement? Uh, the answer is number two. Okay, tell me about it. The spirit and the word. Okay, so Mother is saying to us that we have to take our spirit man, line it up with the word of God. If our spirit man is telling us something and it doesn't line up with the word of God, what does that mean? It's not. It's not, our, it's not the Holy Spirit speaking to us, it's some other spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay. D. What was the final test by which Muller came to understand God's will? And that would be four. He used prayer, Bible study, and reflection to find lasting peace about a proposed direction. Amen. Thank you. So we need what? Prayer? Mm -hmm. Bible study? Mm -hmm. What else? Reflection. reflection. What is reflection? Think about what you study. Think about what God has done. Think about what God is taking you. Think about how you're going to handle it. Think about it. Pastor Rose teaches in the seminary, even before you get up and pray, you think about what you're going to pray about. Don't hold us hostage. <laughs> Don't hold us hostage when you get up there and then you, you're so spiritual, you, you just get into the mood of prayer. Think about it before you stand. Think about it before you open your mouth. Now, is that not letting the Spirit lead you? Is that too structured? Because some people say, I can't do what the Spirit doesn't tell me to do. Is that too structured? How many people think that's too structured? Well, you're not going to say anything tonight. Yes, ma'am. Well, the thing is, sometimes you can, in your head, say, you say what you're going to pray about. And then when you actually pray, especially for me, when I get in front of people, you pray. Use the mic, so I don't fall right there. <laughs> oh. So, uh, for me, if I if I know I'm gonna pray out loud with other people in the room, I in my head come up with what I'm going to say. Okay. Like you said, kind of come up with something. But then when I pray, it doesn't go that way sometimes. Okay. So, I mean, you still come up with something, but the Spirit does lead you in, when the time comes. Okay. Now, did what you pray about contradict what you thought you were going to pray about? 
No, but then contradicted because the, the words are different. different. Right. right. Or, yeah. the, the, or even the specific topic you thought you were going to talk about ends up being a different topic. No, I'm, I'm about to ask you a question I already know. Yes. <laughs> she got no the mic. She finally got the mic. <laughs> so, this is my question. Once your prayer changed, did it push you to pray five? You intend to pray five minutes and push you to pray 25 minutes? I don't know about that part. I know about that part. <laughs> You told that spirit, get me behind me. <laughs> you may not know, but I know. <laughs> Everybody else in here knows, but you know. <laughs> I don't give time limits on prayer. I just, oh, you in don't. my head, I just say what That's I'm trying to, to get out. So That's it's good not to a time thing, it's a topic thing. Amen. <laughs> prayer life. In our private prayer life, we all know how to give time limits. Yeah, right. Yes? We ought to spend quality time with God. Yeah. When we bow down to pray, or when we stand to pray, or when we look out the window to pray, or we close our eyes to pray, we ought to give God time to talk to us. Mm -hmm. And we ought to have time to talk to Him. It's all called communion, communion with God. Let's review the seven realities right quick on page 21. The seven realities. I'm going to start with Sister Davis. Uh, start with Sister, Sister, um, but we'll uh, start with Sister Damage and come back this way. I can't see it. I don't, I don't okay, start with Sister Davis Davis and, and come back this way. You said page 21. Page 21 on the right, right side of the margin, we you reading one through seven realities. The first thing it says, you cannot stay the way you are and go with God. You got to change. One of the worst statements I've heard. You just got to accept me the way I am. No, I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to let you stay the way you are. Because I don't have to accept you the way you are. And it's you in the middle of dispute. This is just who I am. This is where I'm always being. That's a terrible assessment of yourself. You just got to accept me the way I am. No, you, you, you just go on and on. Okay, number one. God is always at work around you. God is always at work around you. God is always doing something. You gotta watch where God is at work so you can join him. Number two. Number two, God pursues a continuing, continuing love relationship with you that is real and perfect. God is pursuing you. And the reason why he's pursuing you is that he wants a love relationship with you. God wants a relationship with you that is personal, that is real. The almighty, awesome God is pursuing you for a personal and a real relationship. Number three. God invites you to become involved with him in his work. God is in the middle of inviting you to come join him. He's at work. He's pursuing you. And he wants you to join him where he's already worked. You don't have to create the work. You don't have to dictate the work. You don't have to find the work. You find God and join God where he's at work. Number four. Number four. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. God is revealing himself. God is speaking. God is revealing his ways. And there are some things and ways he's revealing himself by way of the Holy Spirit. He's revealing himself by way of the Bible. That's why we have to spend time in the Bible. He's revealing himself by way of prayer, circumstances. The stuff we go through, God is revealing himself in the midst of it. God is revealing himself through the church. And why that say through the preacher? God is revealing himself. Let me just say this while I'm here. Uh, in, in the conference this week, Pastor Arrington from Cleveland, Ohio says this. He says, we have to settle some things in our lives once and for all. He said, Christians have to come to a point in their lives where they settle some things once and for all. 
First of all, you got to sell who God is to you. You have to first settle in your heart who God is to you. Secondly, you got to sell in your heart how you going to give to God. You got to just sell it from now on, sell it in your heart, how you going to give to God and make sure you sell it once and for all. Don't pick it up, put it down, pick it up. And then he came out and he said, then you get so technical, you want to tie off the gross or the net. He said, just sell it in your heart. How are you going to respect God? Because your giving doesn't say what you think of your money. It doesn't say what you think of your church. It doesn't say what you think of your preacher. It says what you think of God. How do you feel about God? He, and I asked, I said, you want to come preach at the beginning of Sunday? <laughs> and everybody laughed, just let you know that. <laughs> he, said, he said, you got to sell in your heart what you're going to do about God and how you're going to love God. Mm -hmm. And this is the final one. He said, you got to sell in your heart how you're going to give to the man of God. you got to come to a conclusion and be consistent. How are you going to give to the man of God? I used to not say stuff like this, but God has blessed. He says that you have to sell in your heart how you're going to give to, to, the God, to God, to the church, and to the man of God. And he said to the people that were in the room, that were in the class, he said, I tell you what you do. Walk up to your preacher on Sunday. Put $50 in his hand and just walk off. And he just started walking out the door. Mm -hmm. Then he came back. He said, matter of fact, walk up to your preacher this Sunday and put $100 in his hand and just walk off. Don't tell him what it's all about. Just walk off. Mm -hmm. I said, you sure need to come by the New Beginning Church this Sunday. <laughs> uh, how long are you going to be in town, Pastor Eric? <laughs> so y'all see a tall black guy walking in the door. That's Pastor Eric. <laughs> Where am I? Number five? Number five. Number five. God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. Now this is the toughest spot here. Whenever God asks you to come join him in work, it will always lead to a crisis of belief. That means you will have some hard times. And you gotta walk in faith and it requires action. You gotta walk in faith and it requires action. Number six. I'm number six. Number six. Um, number six says you must make majority adjustments in your life or join God and what He is doing. You got to make major adjustments. You got to make some adjustments that you wouldn't normally make. You got to make adjustments to join God where He's at work, even though you wouldn't make those adjustments to join other folk. You got to make major adjustments in your life. Don't come tell me uh, this is just how I am. I'm a bit, I've been this way all my life. You have not grown. If you had a baby and that baby was twelve inches, let's say, what's the normal size of the baby? Eight, eight pounds. 7 pounds, 20, 20, 7 pounds, so many ounces, right? A normal baby. If that baby was that way a year from now, what would you do? You, you would have been taken to the doctor after the first month. If that baby gets to be two and he hasn't made a sound, what would you do? Take him to the doctor. If that baby is three and still not walking, what would you do? Take him to the doctor. You will be on top of that doctor. You will be calling him. And if he didn't answer, you will show up in the office. Because there's a problem with the baby. But at the church, folk don't grow and we don't even call Jesus for them. We think it's normal for folk to act a fool the rest of their lives. We think it's normal for folk to act like they, they need medication. We think it's normal for folk to act like, hey, well, I've been this way all my life, so ain't nobody going to change me. There are some families that have been fighting all their lives. And they, stay, they fought each other, they fought people in the street, and now guess what? Now they're in church, guess what they're doing? 
They find the church, the fact the past, and everybody else. If a baby physically does not grow, we know something wrong with them. But when people spiritually not grow, we get used to them. That's tragic. Number seven. You, you come to know God by experience as you obey him and he accomplished his work through you. You learn to know God and experience God through the experiences you've had walking with him. The experience you had through your relationship with him. You come to know God in an experiential way because you spent quality time with him. There may be somebody who's never, ever got to know, gotten to know God. This is a moment that you can get to know him through Jesus the Christ. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You can have a right relationship with God. You can be in right fellowship with God. The door is open. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, just bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. Now come into my life. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you honestly prayed this prayer of trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, you are now born again. You're on your way to heaven. Thank you for joining us tonight here at the New Beginning Church. Please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. Join us at 10.30 a.m. For, for church. And thank you. Please continue to join us at 7.15 every Wednesday night for Bible study. Next week, we will be continuing Unit 2. We will be on page number 42 and 43. 42 and 43 for next week, the Experience in God book. God speaks to his people. Please prepare. Please be aware. We're in Hebrews chapter 1 next week, John chapter 14, and John chapter 16 along with John 8. That's Hebrews 1, John 14, John 16, and John 8 on this week. It is often times time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gift. Well, Brother, Brother Whitlock, I messed up your, this opportunity. It is offering time! <laughs> Brother Whitlock taught us how to ask for offering. It is offering time! It is time to give to the Lord through tithe offering and sacrificial gift. Aren't you excited about it? One more thank God for our privilege to give to God. It is offering time. Brother Whitlock taught me that Sunday. Brother Niles, did he teach you that Sunday? It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord. If you want to give by way of electronics, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com. The idea is as we lift Jesus, uh, he will reach all men uh, as we lift him. And you can mail in your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. The deacon is passing out on the road. Raise your hand and you will be served. We're so glad that you joined us for Bible study. Please continue to know that as we wait on the Lord, He will renew us. And He will enable us to mount up with wings like eagles. We're going to run and not be weary. We will walk in our faith if we just wait on the Lord. Let us stand. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for those who own our prayer list. We ask you to continue to walk with us and bless us. Lord, we know, as you, know you as the great provider, the great physician, the comforter, the company keeper. We ask you to be that 
for all of us. Bless our lives, bless our church, that we will continue to shine bright in a dark and difficult world. Bless us now as we make our travels home. We ask you, Father God, to give us safe passage. Give us grace. Bless the choir as they come to sing unto you, Father God. Bless them, Father God, to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join together by saying, Amen. Amen. We are united in the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. You are the business.